I don't see my head anymore. Hang on. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on whatever social media platform you're on. If you're with us live, please drop something in the chat to let us know you're here. If you're watching the replay, make sure to comment, like, and share. Uh, I'm Lisa Dury. I am the co-host here with Dr. Catherine Sayo, and you're here live at Between Us Navigating Lipedema Together. Hi so there. We, yes, hi there. I'm so excited to have Crystal here with us today. You're in for a treat. Yeah, I was just going to say we have a special guest, Crystal Ellingson, and it is quite a treat whenever you're with Crystal. I met Crystal when I was in Potsdam at the Lipedema World Congress, and she had her shirt on, and I heard her voice, but I've only seen her in writing before Potsdam. And so I was like, oh my gosh, you're Crystal. So we became fast friends. We've spent a lot of time talking about our joint experience. And Catherine saw Crystal in this live stream and invited her on. And I was like, hello, we've got to do this. So Crystal Ellingson, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so glad you're here. Um, hey, do you want to just give a quick orientation, Crystal, on your journey with lipedema, how you found out, what, why is it important to be here today? Like, what's on your heart? There is so many things on my heart. One of the huge reasons is because um, I, well, we met a little while ago and I got to speak with Catherine. Uh, Catherine's documentary, uh, Lipedema, the disease they call fat, was a documentary that literally changed the trajectory of my life. Not only did it explain what was happening to me and what has been happening to me for the better part of 30 years, it helped me be kinder to myself. It helped me understand my body in a way that I, I didn't know before. And it set me on a journey of discovery and research and education for not just myself, but for the people around me, my coworkers, my friends, my doctors, my therapists who were all trying to keep me mobile, trying to help me manage my pain that nobody understood where it came from. It com and now I've become this, this advocate and this, this face who talks pretty much constantly about lipedema. And I, I approach people on the street with cards explaining lipedema uh, because as a sufferer myself, I'm somebody who can approach people, women especially, and talk about our bodies in a way that um, not everybody feels comfortable with. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it has been a journey through my, my work. I've had to take a lot of time off. Um, I, I couldn't raise my children and manage my pain. So for 10 years, I was off work. And when my children went to school and I had a little downtime, I took a year off just to see what I thought I could do. I, I got better health care. Uh, in Canada, we have socialized health care, but that, that, that's a very narrow a very narrow list of things that are that are covered like emergency care things like that but as far as managing a disease like this there's nothing available to us here um, especially in, in the Atlantic provinces which are smaller and have a lot less population uh, mm -hmm. and I have and I'll just mentioned I I've gone to court about the denials of my health care uh, that was just a couple of weeks ago. We're still awaiting a decision on that, and, and we can go into more details later. Uh, also, in the last year, especially, uh, there's been other women who are banding together in Canada, and we needed national representation. So myself and about 15 other women have come together to to make Lipedema Canada possible. I'm a director on the the board, and. Uh, Emma Clooney, who I'm hoping at some point you guys get a chance to talk with, she is not only ma magical behind uh, behind the scenes building our entire website, uh, but she she has a story to tell too. And I'm we've been talking about books, and I'm I'm sure she'll have one in the future. That's amazing, Crystal. And I want to just if I can, I want to bring Catherine's voice in because I can only imagine Catherine deciding not on my watch here. I figured this lipedema thing out. I'm not going down quiet mm -mm. builds this documentary. And you and I both have become advocates because this documentary lit a fire in us about awareness. And Catherine, when you did the documentary, was your vision to be building a, 
an, uh, you know, a group of, of, of passionate women who are like, oh my gosh, we have to shout it from the rooftops. I mean, isn't that amazing what's happened when you just said yes to yourself? What are your thoughts, Catherine? Oh my goodness, Crystal. When you said that, my heart leapt. I felt like, oh my God, it really did land the way I wanted it to. I remember at the time thinking, who's going to care about fat legs? Nobody's going to care about fat legs. And a friend of mine said to me, there's only one person that needs to care, and that's you. And at the time, I just figured if one other person learns, if one other person gets help, it's worth it. And it's really been remarkable. <laughs> We're over 4 million views at this point. And it's one of my go-tos. Like when mm -hmm. people say, how did you find out? The first thing I mention is the documentary. Because seeing, seeing it is different than reading it. Mm -hmm. Seeing it is, and seeing other professionals. Like for instance, there was a doctor... I'm having a mind blank. I uh, Stutz? Yeah, Dr. Dr. Stutz was on your documentary. And yes. I've read some stuff from the like research that he's written and other things that he's participated mm -hmm. in. And when I saw him at the uh, Congress, mm -hmm. I went up to him immediately because I was like, I, I saw you on Catherine's documentary and I had a friend that was treated by you and it's completely changed her life. I was just, I felt like I was around like, for me, like the biggest celebrities there are because they completely changed the lives of women, completely. Mm -hmm. And you were a big catalyst for a lot of people to get them to this point where they start to understand, start to do more research, start to ask more questions. Mm -hmm. And we've had communities build off of from this. So, you know, you have your Lipedema Simplified and the Lipedema Project, and now, you know, we have Lipedema Canada and I have a blog and, and so many other things that people are on social media with their stories. And, mm -hmm. a, and a lot of them have started because of your documentary. And I just want to say thank you. Oh, thank you, thank so, you much. so much, Crystal. And I want to, um, I want to bring your voice in, if I may, about what you're doing in, with the court system in Canada, because it's so remarkable. And if you wouldn't mind just telling us your story a bit, because I know it relates to your workplace life, as well as your personal life and your own health. When it comes to the, the legal case, um, I had gotten back to work. So my, my health plan, we have extended health benefits through, through, our, through our jobs. And I, I know there's, there's things like that in the U.S. as well. So the one for the Nova Scotia's teacher union, which is the union that I'm a part of, uh, you have to work a certain amount of days and I couldn't commit to full-time employment uh, because I, I'd only just found out about lipedema a year before I went back to work. That kind of helped me understand what I needed to do and, and things that I'd already been doing, you know, swimming, walking, physiotherapy, vibration, uh, low impact uh, exercise like yoga, all those things were helpful in keeping me mobile and manage my pain. Um, I was taking a lot of pain meds before I started chiropractic care, before I started um, getting more serious with physio on a regular basis. But financially, these things are really unattainable for a lot of people. Um, they're they're a hundred dollars a pop, you know, to go and see your physiotherapist, to see an MLD therapist, it's $150. Like those are things that without extended health benefits for a lot of people, they're just, they're just unmanageable. Mm -hmm. So my extended health benefits allowed me to take care of myself in a way that I was simply unable to before. Uh, my husband has had health benefits uh, for over 15 years, but $1,000 doesn't go a long way. Now, it's better than nothing. I won't disagree. But I had 20 visits to a chiropractor, 20 visits to a physiotherapist, 20 visits to a osteopath, 20 visits to a naturopath. And I mean, there are certain restrictions within those. But 
I, I did never made it past February without using up all of my benefits to manage my pain. And when I started wearing compression garments and having MNLD, those things, they just, and they help, they all help. And we, that's wonderful because you want to have a better quality of life. But when I did all of the things that were recommended and thank goodness for the US standard of care, because uh, it's something that we can take to our doctors to explain not only what the, the symptoms are and what lipidema looks like, but how to care going forward. You know, what are our steps to take? What steps have you taken? And then finally, when I realized that no matter how much I did, no matter how many diets I've tried, I wasn't getting better. I was, I was managing, but still on a steady decline. So that's when uh, surgeries started to become something I needed to look into because I was becoming disabled. I was starting to lose the ability to walk up and down stairs. And I was like, if I need this surgery, if I need this surgery, what do I, what do I need to do to access the care that we have available to us here in Canada? So I, there's no specialist, not very, very many doctors are familiar with it at all. Most of us bring it to our doctors. And once they, once they're tuned in and tuned on, some are super supportive. Some don't want to hear about it, but I mean, that's everywhere for everything. So when I contacted my doctor, I called MSI, which is our, our provincial insurer and every insurer, I think it's similar in America, depending on what state you're in here, depending, depending on what province you're in really dictates what's available to you. So MSI takes care of uh, Nova Scotia's uh, health benefits. I, I know that liposuction is not an insurable service. Um, and when I talked to my doctor about where do we go from here, because she's like, we see that this is, these things are not working. You're still on a steady decline. You're still in a lot of pain. You're, you're, you're a great patient because we've been, we've ticked all the boxes. We've done everything that has been instructed to do. So I called MSI and I said, how do I access out of country care? Because there was a program for people who don't have access within the province to leave to get the care they need. So I called MSI and the first thing they said was you need to find a specialist to get a referral for, for this procedure. And if they think that it's appropriate and they are, they can give us the information that we need to move forward, then you, you can, you should have access to a medically necessary procedure. So I, I wrote them a letter, or excuse me, I wrote them a letter and they said, well, this, you don't have a specialist, but your family doctor will work. Your family, if you don't have a specialist, there has to be something you can do. Contact your family doctor. If they, if they, this is what they think you should do, right, they'll write us a letter. And when they did, they said, sorry, you're denied. You don't have a specialist. And I'm like, okay, so I've kind of got some wrong information. I'm trying to, I'm trying to navigate this, this system and I'm trying to figure out what information do we actually need, but they can't tell me, but they told me that Nova Scotia specialists will know what sort of information we need. So I kind of, there's, I'm kind of between a rock and a hard place. I don't, I don't have anybody to go to. They suggest seeing a plastic surgeon. And so as somebody who advocates for herself and knows her doctor, which there's over a hundred thousand people in Nova Scotia who don't even have a doctor. I start making the rounds and start making phone calls. So I need to find somebody who's versed in lipedema or who has some knowledge about what our treatment options are. So I called every single, even like the pediatric <laughs> um, surgeons, because I, this is not a big place. We don't have a whole lot. So they were like, sorry, we don't treat lipedema. Sorry, we don't know much about lipedema. Sorry, we can't take you on right now as a patient and it's not something we treat. So everywhere I went, I was faced with another barrier. And the one place who said that we have some experience, my BMI was too high. So they probably do work on stage one, but because I have a BMI over 32, they just, they wouldn't even look at me. So barrier after barrier after barrier. And then I call MSI, I let them know that there's nobody here who will see me. They tell me that there is a surgeon that, you know, works for, um, the teaching university in uh, Nova Scotia. I contact their office. They're like, I'm sorry, this information was wrong. It was just one barrier after another, after another. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the minister of health in desperation. 
because if I don't take care of this soon, I'm going to be knee deep in stage three. Already lymphedema is starting to set in. I'm starting to get some swelling that doesn't resolve overnight. And of course my swelling is getting worse and worse even though I wear garments, even though I do the aqua fitness, even though I do vibration, you know, low carb diet, you know, all of those things that we're use, using to manage. And I'm still young, I'm 45 and I have young kids. So I want to, I want to participate in family events. I want to not be in pain all the time. And when I was denied by the Minister of Health, I, I just was like, this, this is not okay. This, this is not appropriate. This is not, no way, no way for women to move forward in this province without having anybody to advocate for them. So I called a lawyer um, and a friend of mine had been going through a very similar experience with lymphedema because we'd have no lymphatic specialists in this area. I think the closest one is in Montreal. And she said, I called a lawyer. Why don't you get in contact with him and see if he thinks you have a case? So we started with what's called a judicial review. So the, the gov or our, our, our lawyer asked for a review of the province's decision to deny our health care and everything that was involved, emails, mostly emails really, and documents that have been shared within the department to other provinces, asking if they've ever covered lipedema surgery, asking if they've ever had anybody travel outside of the, their province. Um, and we got, we got to see all the inside information and then when our, uh, we look through it and when our lawyer looks through it, they, we, we try to find things that are like, this doesn't seem right, this doesn't seem fair, this, what is their policies, what is their procedures, because a lot of it, it's, it's not easy to access on the outside. So when we look through, there, there seemed to be a lot of holes in, in the process. So they contacted other provinces, other provinces have covered it and have uh, had women leave the the province and the country for treatment and they said no we've never done that it must have been something else maybe they don't understand their disease things like that and I think as as you guys you understand lipedema you understand what it means you live it every day you get it and you get it in a way that medical professionals often don't get it because you live it every day I understand my disease and they were talking about me like I was an idiot and it was embarrassing the way they spoke about me in these documents. So my, we, had a, we had a case moving forward. We tried to add some additional uh, evidence because we're saying our chartered rights as Canadians are being violated and we don't have uh, equal access to care. And not having a specialist means that you can't access programs that are designed for people who can't get the care they need within their province. Now, mine is not an insurable service. The woman who I went forward with, Jennifer Brady, hers was an insurable service. I mean, we'll see how it all turns out, but somebody needed to challenge. The government's never challenged on the decisions they make. In healthcare, it's very, very rare, and a lot of people won't even take it on because they kind of know the cards are stacked against them. And the policy hasn't been changed in like 30 years, and we know how far our medicine has come in 30 years. So all of those things to say, we went to court, it took almost two years to get a date. And when I did, my lawyer had a very good understanding of the case. And the judge seemed to really have gone through and really had a good understanding in a way that I, I wasn't expecting, because it's a lot. There's hundreds and hundreds of pages of information. And when the government's lawyer or the minister's lawyer um, was talking about things like uh, the, um, our, our chartered rights. We didn't say that our chartered rights were being violated under section whatever. And, and the, uh, the, the judge was kind enough to bring up that, you know, th these women don't have that language. They're not lawyers. And I, I felt heard in a way that I was not expecting um, in a courtroom. So I, I have, you know, I can't say that, yes, I really feel confident we're gonna win this. This is going to be wonderful for every, you know, for all of our community. But I can say that it's a step in the right direction. And if we do, if if we're, 
if our our legal response from the judge is that this was and on this these procedures were were not were not performed correctly or unfair to us then we can proceed forward if the government doesn't want to settle with uh with other actions like suing so that's kind of where we see this going if they if they continue to deny our right to care one of the things that I'm hearing in your story, Crystal, if I can summarize for the listener, and I would love to see what people are saying in chat, so we'll take a look at that, is that what you're talking about is the complexity and um, the, the loneliness of living with a disease that's misunderstood. What you're talking about is what people say, you know, it's a full-time job to manage lipedema, and I have a full-time job. You know, what you're talking about is finding your voice when you just want to give up. And what you're talking about is not even having all the answers and doing it anyway, right? And so when I like summarize in my head what I heard you say, I think everyone can glean some inspiration about when they're feeling stuck or overwhelmed or some thought of what might be next or how might I help myself more? Because the thing that I know in my experience too, especially with all the work that I've been so blessed to have exposure to all the experts inside Lipedema Simplified and Lipedema Project, is there are answers, right? We we know our bodies and there are answers in the system. Like, you know, you, you know, fangirling on Dr. Stutz, right? Like these are the things, right? I, with Every time someone meets Catherine, they're like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. So what I think you're doing for your province and your country is so remarkable in, in putting a voice to it and letting people see the personal side because so many times we suffer in silence and we just push through. So I just want to take a minute and let people drop into chat any questions or comments for you. Give, <coughs> excuse me, give us a moment to just take in what you said, because this takes courage, tenacity, perseverance. Um, what's spa? Is that the word? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and I think one of the things I know about the lipedema community is there's a lot of that in us because we've had to figure it out for ourselves. So I'm going to look at chat real quick because we always want to bring the voices in. That's why we live stream. Catherine, if you have any comments for Crystal on her story, I'm going to go scan chat real quick and let's make sure we're interacting with the audience too. Yeah, I think that's great, Lisa. The other thing I want to add, and I think it's part of the complexity, is that it has to do with the implicit and explicit bias that we have as a culture, as a, as a humanity. <clears throat> around weight, that weight as an entity or as part of any other complex problem adds a whole additional, um, often inaccurate belief that it's lifestyle choices and that the person who is dealing with a weight issue is to blame for the weight issue. There is a kind of, um, energetic and even within the healthcare system, especially within the healthcare system that says it's your fault. Mm -hmm. And that I think is such a part of the complexity that we deal with. No question. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that, Catherine. And you know, the other thing I'll say, and I, I will pop up a comment here, which is a very impactful one, Crystal. You're, you know, Crystal, you said, thank you for changing my life, Catherine. There's people in here going, thank you, Crystal. So we're going to bring those up. But I think about the employers, you know, when you have someone who has cancer and they have to go through chemo and radiation and all the doctor's appointments, it's really established at this point. People know if you have that type of treatment plan, you're going to be missing work. You might need flexible time off. You're going to need um, some accommodations, right? And the thing about lipedema, when you're talking about MLD and physio and all the other things, that's a lot of time too. And that's I think employers time. need to understand this component to it, right? Because I've heard so many stories from lipedema ladies, like, I don't even want to tell my boss I need to go to another doctor's appointment, right? Um, because they're worried they're going to get labeled or, you know, judged or lose their jobs. And I think the more we talk about what it takes to care for our bodies, the more employers will have, like, the personal stories behind it. So I just want to present, I'm so grateful of the way that you categorized all the different things you had to do. And what I'd like to do is there's a, um, a comment here, Gail, from Winetta about um, what she went through. So I'm going to read it to you. Uh, Crystal, can you see it? 
You can. Thank you. Okay. So it's just like never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Right. And that's by Margaret Mead. And Juanetta was talking about um, the, her lived experience, which was similar to yours. So, you know, putting a voice and putting a name here is so important. And, you know, to be denied and humiliated by the system, you know, keep up the good fight, Crystal and Lipidema Canada. Right. Um, and she saw, a, she was um, quoting a, a case here, Causita versus Aetna, that changed everything for her. So you're not alone, right? And the more you talk, the more we can band to support each other too. And then um, Dana has a question. Uh, Crystal, what provinces in Canada allow for surgery outside of Canada? She's in Ontario. All of them have a program. Uh, the question is, how do you get access to that program? And for us in Nova Scotia, it says, as long as the procedure is medically necessary, then we should have access, whether it is a insured service or not. And some of the language is standard across provinces, but all provinces have some sort of program for access to care outside of their province and outside of the country. But getting the documents together to, to do that, it's really set, it's just, it's barrier after barrier after barrier. And I have a huge problem with that. So. I'm going to try to continue this fight to bring down some of those barriers. Mm -hmm. um, check it out. Call your, I, I don't remember what Ontario is called, but give, uh, give your in provincial insurer a call and see what sort of information you, you can get on, on that policy because there, there, there is a policy in every province. Okay, great. And it looks like your colleagues from Lipidema Canada are here. So let's pop up their, their comment here too. So surgery has been covered for lipedema in the province in British Columbia, and three people were covered in Manitoba out of country for lipedema surgery in the U.S. and Germany. So why don't we just do a shout out to Lipidema Canada, who just launched this month, right? You all came together and you're out in the world. We're so glad you're here. And I think that it's really important that the Canadians have this sort of organization to be able to coordinate, to talk to each other. I know at every event we do, we have a breakout for Canada. It's always like the Canadians want to be together. We need support, right? So at our heart to heart coming up this week that we already planned for breakouts for Canada, you know what I mean? Like this matters. Um, and so I'm so glad you're all here. And I think what I'd like to do with, um, to wrap up today is Crystal, I'd love, do you have any tips? What tips do you have for ladies in this situation? And potentially, what should employers be thinking about as they're supporting ladies with lip lipedema in the workplace? What comes to mind? Well, accommodations is huge. And depending on the type of work you do, like as a teacher, it's really difficult to make plans and lesson plans for, for people coming into your room as often as I'd be taking time off. So I was able to move into a different role um, and substituting worked really well for me. Daily, I have more control over my schedule. Uh, and if things come up and I'm unable to work that day, I don't, I'm not committed to you know making lesson plans and planning for that and doing all the work around. So I've had to change my role to accommodate my illness. But when it comes to em employers making that time, I. I think there should be more flex. I say I think they should be more flexibility. I think a lot of jobs there there can be, but employers choose not to have that flexibility because they want people to work from, you know, nine to five, not outside of those work hours. But because access to therapies and doctors and things happen within that time frame, there's lots mm -hmm. of work that can be done at other times, depending on what type of role you have and what type of job you have. So I think that that employers need to look at that a lot more seriously. People can work from home in a way that they couldn't uh, before COVID. There's, mm -hmm. there, there is flexibility on time that we can pull from. We can have time now and, and take time maybe on the weekend when we don't have access to carers or therapies or doctors. There, mm -hmm. there's, the flexibility is huge. We want to work. We want to provide, we want to be active participants in our lives in general. Um, I think that's something we need to look at is the flexi flexibility within spaces and flexibility to, to work from home and get the things yeah, I that appreciate that. to make our days mm -hmm. more productive for everyone. Yeah. I think yes. it's, it's such a, 
it's it speaks to mindset it speaks to how people come into an understanding um i can't imagine some of the restrictions being put on someone who's dealing with cancer and needs to go to chemotherapy because it's looked at differently yeah yeah, I was thinking, um, I was in human resources for most of my career, and we had rooms for nursing mothers where you could go and pump for your breast milk to be available for your children when you were in the office. And I started thinking to myself a couple of years ago, like, you could put your lymphatic pump in the nursing room, and then use that for yourself if you had to be in the office, right? Because I pump at home. Yeah. And I always joke, I say, let's talk when I pump. And people are like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, well, my lymphatic pump, right? But I think we can be more creative. I think we can be more flexible. And I think your points are spot on. And Catherine, you always summarize so well. The mindset of the employer is a key piece of this, right? Um, so one of the things I know for sure is that when I changed my, um, when I became more aware of the inflammatory impact of food on my body, <clears throat> it definitely impacted me. And I was always at work bringing smoothies and shakes and cranberry water and everything else. And so I just want to make sure I say something real quick as we wrap up, because we do have our three-day heart-to-heart um, Lipidema Simplified Conference happening starting this Friday. And one of the things that I know is that when you're in less pain, you have more mental um, clarity to be able to take action. So Catherine, anything you want to say about heart-to-heart -heart as we close out today? Come join us. <laughs> We yeah, have, two, yeah, we have two conferences a year and this, each one takes six months to put it in. We're wrapping up all the prep work and it starts on Thursday with a kickoff. And then the conference itself is Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And what we do is we put a, a, um, a schedule together that answers the questions that we are being asked. So we found that keto has been very helpful for a lot of women. Doesn't work for everyone. People say, what else? So this is an entire weekend on nutrition. While it includes some about keto, it also includes more than that. So it's called Keto and Beyond. And it really is both experts, from uh, really around the world, we have Dr. Faber, who was the um, um, head uh, on the um, German guidelines for lipedema. And Germany is where most of what we know about the lymphatic system comes from, um, from the practitioners in Germany. So um, she's one of our speakers. She's our, one of our keynotes. So we have highly qualified, very knowledgeable experts, and we have a community. Our community is about supporting one another. Like you can see time and time and time again, as Lipedema ladies, we learn, we know, we have the personal experience, as Dr. Carmody likes to say, the wisdom is in each one of us. And so we have opportunities throughout the entire three days to interact with one another. So we learn from each other. We connect, we network, and we have support. You can tell I'm, I'm listening to myself and I'm like, oh my God, I'm, th I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. And you know, one of the things that, um, Crystal, I don't know how this affects Canada, so I'd love your, your input on it. And I know we're wrapping up, so I'll be brief, but, you know, we're actually even talking about um, semi-glutides, GLP-1s, right? It's not just, you know, carnivore or keto. We're literally talking about the medications that everyone's talking about, and we're bringing in the expertise there. So are you seeing that a lot, um, Crystal, in your groups, everyone asking if GLP-1s and semi-glutide is, you know, helpful for lipedema? Because that seems to be a hot topic in the U.S. for sure. It's definitely a hot topic here too. We have a lot of women with lipedema who are um, taking those medications. We do find that there is success in weight loss around these. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Is it lipedema fat or healthy fat? You know that that remains to be seen. Is it? Uh, we we know that it subsides your hunger hormone, and a lot of it speaks to, you know, 
what, what are more natural, some people want to know what are more natural ways for our bodies to recognize those hormones instead of mm -hmm. using those drugs. But at the same time, they're really helpful to a lot of people um, in getting the getting some of that weight down so people can participate in their lives mm -hmm. in a way that they're not able to uh, when they're really swollen, re the, the weight, the weight of lipedema. The weight it's of lipidema so is it's so complex. And yeah, we're we're doing a little plug for your blog right now. This is the weight of lipidema, right? It's so good. And yeah. it's so complex. It it's is so yeah. complex. It, yeah. it affects every aspect of our lives. Mm -hmm. And yeah. depending on what stage you're at, you may not realize you have it. Or if you're at stage four, you know, there there's so there there's so little left your body can do. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes those conversations are really good because a lot a lot of people are suffering. But when it comes to, I think a lot about those who are at at final stage, like at at late stage, late stage four, and what can we do for them right now, mm -hmm. right now that will give them a better quality of life? What yeah. what kind of things can we do for them? What can we give them access to? Like whether it be pump machines i've seen some you know they're very accommodating all sizes how do we get the the swelling down how do we take care of the lymph how how do we get garments to fit when we can barely have access to fitters and the money and the money involved in care is so substantial and crippling and crushing and families just want to help each other and communities we want to help each other um and that's, it's just something that's been on the top of my mind. Um, yeah. right? like how, how do we help those who are late stage in this moment right now? And that's something yeah. that I, I definitely want to spend more time thinking about. And I'm, I'm hoping that, that this conversation maybe will get some other people thinking about it. And like some of us have some wiggle room. There's days that are worse, days that are better, pain days that are worse, pain days that are, but for people in late stage, it's every minute, every day, all the time. How do we get them the support they need? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Catherine, I'm going to turn it over to you to wrap it up because I know that that's near and dear to your heart and how the community started was, you know, stage threes, right? Like there's mm -hmm. a lot there. And um, Crystal, thank you for presencing that. Thank you for being here today. And I'm going to leave it to Catherine to, Send us with her inspiration as always on uh, what to think about until next time on Between Us Navigating Lipedema Together. Catherine, why don't you close us out? Yeah, so um, I just want to close us out with uh, um, we have a free webinar tonight with Dave Feldman, who is an incredible researcher and contributor, way more to just the field of lipedema, but on citizen science which I want to say, and Crystal, you are an incredible example and model of this, what advocacy can do. And what tonight's about is citizen science, N equals one. You are your own laboratory. You are your own voice. You can make a difference. And Crystal, I want to extend an invitation for you to come back because we could go on and on and on. We're over time by 10 minutes and I don't feel like we've even scratched the surface. So would you be open to coming back and doing a much longer conversation with us in the community? 100%. Okay, great. Yay. Uh, so thank you. And um blessings to you and to i can't wait to hear what happens with your court case and i have a feeling you're paving the way for all the canadian lipedema ladies and thank you thanks thank you. Lisa. thank you everyone until next time we'll see you there and crystal thanks for bringing your voice and your heart we're really glad you're here today bye <laughs>